My name is Ed Knox. I'm the director of the Roten Center for International Affairs this year. Today's lecture is entitled Reflections on American Hegemony in Light of the Invasion of Iraq. The lecture is given in the context of the extraordinary College Museum exhibition called Treasure from the Royal Tombs of Ur. The lecture is sponsored by the Middlebury College Museum of Art, the Roten Center for International Affairs, Department of Political Science, and Atwater Commons. Our speaker today is Lieutenant General William E. Odom. General Odom is a graduate of the U.S. Military Academy and holds a Ph.D. from Columbia. He's a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and adjunct professor of political science at Yale. Among his many assignments, General Odom has served as director of the National Security Agency, assistant chief of staff for intelligence, and military assistant to the president's assistant for national security affairs. He's worked on strategic planning, Soviet affairs, nuclear weapons policy, telecommunications policy, and Persian Gulf security issues. He has published articles in such journals as Foreign Affairs, World Politics, The National Interest, and many others. He's also a frequent radio and television commentator and a periodic contributor to op-ed page, op pages in many of the country's major newspapers. Bill holds an honorary degree from Middlebury and served as trustee from 1988 to 1997. If I can add a personal note, uh, no one ever left a conversation with Bill Odom without knowing exactly what he thought. Uh, I'm confident it will be the same today. Uh, he's agreed to take questions uh, after the lecture. And again, the title is Reflections on American Hegemony in Light of the Invasion of Iraq. Please give a warm welcome back to General William Odom. Ed, thank you for that introduction, particularly for that bit of candor at the end. Uh, probably the most accurate thing you've said up here. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back to Middlebury and see a lot of old friends and maybe to make some new ones while I'm here. Uh, my lecture, as he said, um, it's a variant of one I've given in a few other places over the last year, several months. Uh, but because the events and the conditions that inspired it or even more pressing today, I believe the message is worth repeating. It starts with the central ideas of the book I published in 2004 called America's Inadvertent Empire and uses that perspective to assess what is happening in Iraq today as well as the untoward consequences of several of other contemporary American policies toward the rest of the world. America's global hegemony is generally accepted as a fact, only its duration is in question. The answer will not be given by a new rising threat from China or by terrorists. The quality of American leaders will provide it. How they use it will determine whether or not we lose it. America has acquired an empire inadvertently not a traditional one, but a sui generis empire, a regime type heretofore unknown. And I define it by four characteristics. First, it is ideological and not territorial. The ideology is classical liberalism, not democracy. Our founding fathers did not use the word democracy in the Constitution knowingly. They sought to limit the state and to guarantee individual rights. Once rights were secured, voting would follow, not the other way around. This empire, therefore, consists of constitutional states, not dictatorships, and not illiberal democracies. Second, the American empire has been a money-making, not a money-losing regime. Throughout the Cold War, when the defense budget averaged 7.2% uh, of the GDP each year, the United States sustained unprecedented growth. So too did Europe and Japan uh, and other countries in Northeast Asia. They had their longest periods of growth and peace in the histories of both regions. Contrary to popular belief, the Japanese and the Europeans did not get rich at our expense. Throughout this entire period, we have maintained between 30, 20 and 30 percent of the world's gross product, far more than Great Britain had at the height of its imperial uh, period. 
Third, the third defining characteristic, countries have fought to join the American empire, not to leave it. Since the U.S. invasion of Iraq, however, that might be changing. It has no formal boundaries or membership. Any country with a constitutional order, stable property rights, an effective dispute adjudication and autonomous courts may consider itself a member. Neutral countries such as Austria and Switzerland can be included if they want to consider themselves so. Some countries with constitutional orders that have not yet, uh, have not yet become a mature regime are also included because they're within our military alliance systems. Of the roughly 40 countries that can claim membership, only about two dozen have stable constitutional systems. I want to emphasize that. About two dozen stable constitutional systems. That is, that they've lasted for more than a generation. And uh, most others, or the others, mostly new members of NATO, are committed to constitutional developments, but they're still struggling for the, to pass the first generation uh, test without a relapse. The usual standard among political scientists for assessing whether or not a lasting constitutional order has been achieved. Now, that's a small percentage of the countries in the UN General Assembly. The kinds of countries that you take for normal, like the United States, are extremely abnormal. Fourth, our military alliances in Europe and Northeast Asia have supplied supranational political military governance for our allies many of whom are old enemies. This point, I think, is least understood about the American public. Our alliances, our alliances were set up in Western Europe to protect our friends from each other. The Soviet threat was hardly mentioned in the French debate over whether they wanted to join NATO. They were concerned about Germany. So was everyone else. There was no Soviet threat, military threat. It was seen as a political threat. And the, the military threat did not arise until North Korea invaded South Korea. And even after 1950, the United States always took that military threat in the Soviet Union more seriously than Europeans. When Adenauer argued to get into NATO in 1955, if you go back and research his arguments, he does not mention the Soviet military threat. He mentions German rearmament and German sovereignty. The same is true in East Asia. If you know the histories of Japan and Korea, you'll understand that our troops in both countries defend each country from the other. Uh, these are umbrellas which allow our, these uh, allies to trust one another in a way that they would not otherwise, and this has the practical consequence of greatly lowering the transaction costs the, in their business uh, dealings and thus it permits them to gain much higher gains from trade. And this role is still needed in both regions, even without an external military threat. The absence of the Soviet military threat does not take away the initial basic rationale for NATO. In fact, the new members in East Europe are very much in the situation of the new members in Western Europe in 1949, 1950. They are not friends of each other's, nor are they necessarily traditional friends of the powers of Central Europe and Western Europe. Additionally, the United States has created a governing network uh, of other international institutions, economic and judicial. The uh, World Trade Organization, the uh, International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the United Nations, the uh, several international courts, uh, some of which we won't join now, and others. Now, these organizations have also facilitated economic growth through rule-based decision-making rather than by imperial dictates. That practice also lowers the transaction costs to the United States for managing these international organizations as well as the military alliances. When American leaders belittle and condemn these organizations, they endanger the very foundations of this remarkable system of mutually beneficial liberal governance. The cost is not just damage to our ideals. It also involves billions of dollars of unnecessary expenses. 
How and why is that true? The Nobelist economist Douglas North has demonstrated that governance by rule-based third-party enforcement is the key to sustaining growth over long periods of time because it does make stable property rights and uh, insurance of a reinforcement of contracts much lower, a much lower a price to, uh, to maintain. And countries that do not have this, there are no examples that have had a full century of sustained growth. And it starts with the Dutch Republic, the English Republic after that, and since that time, those that have joined this group of stable constitutional orders have enjoyed some ups and downs, but over the long period of three or four centuries have had sustained growth. That is why the United Nations, NATO, the World Trade Organization, and other such institutions help reduce the price to America for managing the system. Now, liberal institutions, therefore, are the key source of American power, both at home and abroad. It's not the size of our population. It's not our natural resources. It's not our climate. It's our liberal institutions. Not democracy although that becomes indispensable, like an indispensable component of constitutional regimes. So it's not democracy that drives this. The states within this system today produce about 70% of the world's gross product with 17% of the world's population. That dwarfs anything any other what could be called an imperial regime has ever managed. That figure alone gives us a real sense of just how much more productive liberal institutions uh, uh, are and how much more productive power they have. And they, can, they can generate more than any other system. It also shows that the main obstacles to peace and prosperity in those countries outside the American empire is not money. Important point. Aid doesn't help them. It is the shortage of constitutional governance. No amount of economic aid will either account, uh, compensate for or produce that kind of government. In fact, most economic aid makes it less likely that poor countries will achieve effective government. Unfortunately, no one knows precisely how to create liberal constitutional breakthroughs. I used to think that my discipline, comparative politics and political science, did. I've had, after a certain amount of research and practice in what I've called colonialism by ventriloquy in Vietnam, come to a different view on that. Their emergence, that is, these constitutional orders are, are highly problematic and rare. Moreover, most of them have arisen through periods of violence that lead to compromise among the elites and a deal to abide by the rules. When did the U.S. finally resolve its disputes? over the Constitution, not till 1865. We did not get there by voting. At the same time, violence in countries has far more often thrown countries off the track to a compromise. So it's hard to find a key. The record to date suggests that ethnic, racial, and sectarian fragmentation in the country makes the constitutional breakthrough virtually impossible. It also suggests that most political cultures outside the Western world are highly resistant to the idea of a contract state and inalienable civil rights. Japan, Turkey, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore stand out as huge exceptions, not fully constitutional in all cases, but certainly close to it. This evidence suggests to me that few additional countries will become constitutional and able to sustain long-term growth in the next few decades. Neither China, nor India, nor Russia is a good prospect. All three may prosper for a while, and they may be troublemakers, but not in the long run unless they can create liberal domestic institutions. This is why rising challengers cannot destroy the American empire. Only our leaders can do that by throwing our power away. For the most of the Cold War, American leaders uh, used our hegemony with remarkable effectiveness. The Marshall Plan is merely one example. Stabilizing Northeast Asia during and after the Korean War is another. Less well remembered is bringing Germany into NATO against strong re French resistance. 
For two years, Washington danced around the French hostility to German rearmament, working to establish the European defense community to meet that French objection. Although Paris refused to dissolve its own army into the European defense community, it finally accepted Germany's sovereignty and its membership in NATO in 1955. Had the United States insisted on that outcome in 1953, I doubt the alliance would have survived. This pattern, nudging, encouraging, not demanding, often adjusting to European concerns, and getting help from some other countries and convincing those that resist has produced constructive outcomes. There was no such hege hegemon within the, the League of Nations in the interwar period. That's why it fell apart. One country, one vote led to paralysis. One country, one vote with a hegemon who works carefully can overcome paralysis. That's the lesson of NATO versus the League. Now the doctrine of forward defense in NATO uh, implemented formally in 1967-68, uh, was a third attempt at an agreed overall NATO uh, defense plan. And it was achieved precisely in this way, with a European-led study, the Harmel Report, advancing it as a compromise. We saw this pattern again, both in the decision to deploy intermediate-range nuclear uh, forces in Europe during the Carter administration, and in successfully deploying these missiles against much Soviet-backed and inspired European public opposition during the Reagan administration. But none of these examples can revival the reunification of Germany in 1990. This is the largest strategic realignment without a war in the history, major war in the history of Europe. A feat so spectacular that it's unlikely to be rivaled any time in the history of any time soon in the history of diplomacy. Today we tend to take it as foreordained. It was not. Had the Europeans had their way on a straight up or down vote, only two countries, the United States and West Germany, would have voted for it. Germany would be reunited anyway, outside NATO, a rump war so packed probably would have survived. Europe would be without the European Union, and the continent would be a political and military mess. Yet, through skillful diplomacy, backed by overwhelming U.S. military and economic power, President George H. Bush backed the German Bundeskanzler Helmut Kohl in cutting a deal with Moscow. He split Prime Minister Thatcher, the most adamant opponent of German reunification, from a somewhat less adamant opponent uh, President Mitterrand of France and pushed through NATO approval. While Bush cornered Thatcher, Cole appeased Mitterrand by promising to push through the Maastricht Treaty. Thus, Germany was reunified within NATO. The European Union was soon born out of the Maastricht Treaty, and both the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union collapsed. Not even the hardest of American hardliners against Soviet power would have believed this outcome is possible. As I say, I think future historians will have to observe this as the greatest diplomatic feat we've seen, at least to date. It took skill, but it was possible because of American hegemonic power. And I might add, it was also, we were lucky in having leaders who were willing to take the risk, which turned out to be politically suicidal for them, in the case of Gorbachev and Sherbert Nazi, particularly Sherbert Nazi, he likes to say, and I've heard him say in private, one, German, one Georgian divided Germany, another Georgian reunited Germany. For those of you not old, or remember, or old enough or forget that Stalin was a Georgian, Stalin was the divider. Um, as a final example, let us recall the Persian Gulf War, 1990, 91. Uh, President George H. Bush won the UN Security Council backing, assembled a large military coalition, people voluntarily came along with troops that were quite able to fight, even the French joined us, expelled the Iraqi forces in Kuwait, persuaded Japan, Germany, and a dozen other countries to provide money. Sufficient contributions were made to defray all of our costs for the Gulf War. I trust by now you understand what I mean when I speak of how to use American hegemony. Over the last dozen years, however, 
and especially since 2002, we've been seeing examples of how to lose it. During the 1990s, we saw the Clinton administration cut its ground and tactical air forces by almost half. The maritime forces were cut almost none. That force structure left the U.S. firmly in control of the porpoises and the whales, while it left the land to the tyrants in the Balkans. Uh, the, it, the timidity, and I'd say diffidence and dilly-dallying during the disintegration of Yugoslavia marked Washington's reaction to spreading instability in southeastern Europe. This is not somewhere in the, in the third world. This is in, South, this is in southeastern Europe. This affects life in western Europe. It affected stability there. By bombing Serbia and Kosovo for, for 73 days, President Clinton damaged the U.S. image in much of Europe and elsewhere and delayed the decisive toppling of this corrupt and anti-liberal regime, um, both regimes, one in um, uh, Bosnia and uh, also in Serbia, uh, and an outcome that's still not achieved today in the case of Serbia, and nearly a decade later. Had he launched a ground invasion with a couple of armored brigades advancing from Hungary down the big flat Vojvodina plain to Belgrade, he could have destroyed Milosevic and his regime in a week or ten days with few casualties. As a matter of record, the German army, with much less military superiority, did the same thing in 1940 in a week with fewer than 12 casualties. And I would think we ought to be able to meet that standard. A direct occupation, predominantly with U.S. forces, but also jointly with NATO four countries, could have administered and directly governed uh, the, these countries, reestablishing property rights and effective courts, raised a new generation of political elites genuinely committed to liberal values. The prospects there are not like the prospects in Africa, the Middle East, and other parts of the world. They have a Roman code law tradition, feudal traditions of contract arrangements for states for which there is not one shred of tradition in many other parts of the world. Now, in spite of President Clinton's feckless use of our power in the Balkans, I commend him highly uh, for responding to pressures in the U.S. to expand NATO. He was uh, ambivalent about that at first, uh, but changed his mind and opened the doors to three new members, Poland, Hungary, and uh, Czechoslovakia, as it was. Uh, well, no, I guess it was the Czech Republic by then. But the... Uh, uh, this preempted a lot of ethnic conflict. The kind of ethnic conflict you saw in Kosovo could easily have arisen in southern Slovakia, where there's a large Magyar population, in the Vojvodina, where there's a large Magyar population. Transylvania it was an excellent model for the Kosovo uh, uh, ethnic cleansing in Romania. Those countries abstained from those kinds of uh, nationalistic uh, ethnic-minded policies because they wanted in NATO. They wanted under the U.S. umbrella. They wanted in this Western empire. Um, President George W. Bush followed this change uh, to an effective use of American hegemony by further expanding NATO. And I think if he had not let some of these in on a second round, we might well have had another course of us, say, in Transylvania. But his unbridled unilateralism, beginning with the rejection of the Kyoto Treaty and his tariffs on steel imports, proved more destructive to American power than Clinton's foreign policy, even though diffident and bumbling it, that it might have been. Still, the events of 9-11 restored unprecedented global support for the, Americas, for the United States in his fight against uh, al-Qaeda. Once the president announced the axis of evil thesis and his State of the Union message in 2002, however, that support began to decline. NATO had, after 9-11, invoked Article 5 of the treaty for the first time in the history of the alliance, declaring that Al-Qaeda's attack on the United States was also an attack on all other members. They signed up to fight Al-Qaeda. They were shocked to learn that the president was declaring war on Iraq, Iran, and North Korea without even consulting them. His so-called global war on terrorism was being stretched to justify invasions of countries anywhere, something that most of them understandably refused to accept. 
Now, failure to gain the UN Security Council's approval for the invasion of Iraq ensured that the financial cost of the war, not to mention the loss of life uh, and moral standing in the world opinion, would be huge and that the quality of the coalition members would be poor. For example, we didn't have French troops this time. We had these troops from great superpowers like Mongolia and, and Honduras. Uh, Costs of the war rise every day, well above 300 billion, and they may be as high as 500 million if we had better cost and accounting of it. And we can be sure that other countries will not share these costs with U.S. taxpayers. The president may have delighted American voters by asserting U.S. sovereignty against the will of our allies in the Security Council, behavior we normally associate with respect of a country like France, but not of a country that built the post-Cold War order, uh, the post-international uh, or post-World War II order. But I don't think they'll be so delighted with the impact of, of his policies now on their pocketbooks for years to come. Um, as a spectacular example of how to squander American hegemony, fiscally, militarily, politically, and morally, the Iraq War will probably turn out to be the greatest strategic disaster in American history. We can, can we still save this empire at this stage of the game? I don't know. Maybe it's too late. I like to think we can. Uh, if we are to do so, the first step must be withdrawal from Iraq. That invasion was never in the American interest. Rather, it advanced the interest of Iran by avenging the Iranians, uh, avenging the Iranians for Saddam's invasion of Iran in 1980 and eight bloody years of war. And it advanced the interest of Al-Qaeda by making Iraq, for the first time, open to Al-Qaeda's uh, cadres, where they are both killing Americans and Iraqis, and taking their newly gained skills to other countries. All the debate today over the tactical mistakes we have made in Iraq, if you've read books like Fiasco and Cobra II, they're really quite beside the point, although somewhat chilling and terrifying. All the unhappy consequences were destined to occur once the invasion started. More worrisome, the war has paralyzed the U.S. strategically, and that's why a withdrawal today is essential before anything else can happen. The precondition for regaining diplomatic and military mobility is withdrawal, no matter what kind of mess is left behind. And to the answer, we can't leave that mess behind. If we had left in the end of 2003, we left less of a mess than had we left in 2004. And had we left then, we would have left a mess that's bigger, but it will be less than the one of 2005 and so on. Uh, the United States bears the blame for this, but it can't avoid the consequences by staying the course. And that's the difficult point to get through people's heads, even those who know it's a mistake and would like to pull out. I've talked to several members of the Congress, uh, uh, senators who've said, how do I deal with that question? Every day longer, my answer to them is that we stay on course, the costs go up and make the, event, the, the, the depth of eventual defeat much larger. Only after the United States withdraws can it possibly rally sufficient international support to prevent the spread of the damage beyond the region and maybe within the region. Now, it cannot do that, however, unless it also changes some other policies. And I'm going to suggest five that must either be abandoned or altered and I could make the list longer, but time, I will, for, for illustrative persons, I'll use these. First is our non -nuclear, nuclear non-proliferation policy. It was meant to maintain regional stability. Our pursuit of it has actually accelerated proliferation and created instability. The lesson that Iran and others must draw is that if they acquire nuclear weapons, Washington will embrace them as it has Pakistan and India. Either the United States, even the earlier the United States, let Israel uh, proliferate, and that adds to the incentives for all of the Arab states to proliferate as well. 
Our non-proliferation policy in Northeast Asia has worsened the relationship with South Korea to the point of pushing Seoul toward the North Korean, toward the Chinese security orbit. Southern, uh, Southern Koreans increasingly wonder why North Koreans, they're Koreans, why can't they have advanced technology like the United States? They don't seem to see the danger of the weapons the way you do. And that is making them increasingly anti-American and more pro-Chinese. At the same time, it's allowed Korea to make a joke of U.S. diplomacy in the region and to increase China's influence. I arranged to have the test in North Korea so it would illustrate this point for you today. Uh, unacceptable, but accepted. Uh, this opens the path to a unified Korea without U.S. troops and with nuclear weapons. That's where we're headed on the path we're going. A sure formula for prompting the Japanese to acquire nuclear weapons. The second perverse policy is the so-called global war on terrorism. As many critics have pointed out, terrorism is a, not an enemy, it's a tactic. The United States has a long record of supporting terrorists and using terrorist tactics. The slogan of the war on terrorism today merely makes the United States look hypocritical to the rest of the world. A prudent American president would end the present policy, which I describe as sustained hysteria, uh, order the removal of most of the new safety barriers in Washington and elsewhere, and treat terrorism as a serious but not a strategic problem. Encourage Americans to regain their confidence and refuse to let Al-Qaeda keep us in a state of fright. Let me remind you, no terrorists have ever brought down a republic, but acts of parliament have closed a few. Lenin rejected terrorism because he thought it was a feckless tool for taking power. Insurgents do take power. Terrorists don't. The third perverse policy is spreading democracy. It's a very bad practice. <laughs> By now, it should be clear why I say so. We should try to spread constitutional order, not democracy, which, if it's implemented before a constitution is accepted, will almost certainly be illiberal, allowing varying degrees of tyranny over minorities. Pick up the last issue of comparative politics and read an article by an Indian about why India is not a liberal country at the local level, yet everybody thinks India is a democracy and we should treat it as one. It's not in my empire list. It is not liberal. It's an illiberal democracy. So is Iran, so is Russia, and a lot of other of our favorite countries. It makes sense to support individual rights and liberties everywhere. We can be for those, but we don't have to designate the regime type. It's easy to establish democratic voting procedures, and they will ensure that there are no liberties if you get them if you start the, re the voting before a constitutional order, as I've said. Now, the fourth misguided policy may not be as obvious to you, and it concerns the defense defense department's military redeployments that have been planned and seem to be going forward. Mr. Rumsfeld is hollowing out NATO long before the new members in Eastern Europe have achieved their constitutional breakthroughs and transformed their militaries. We will, by his planning, we will have two brigades in Europe instead of two divisions and a corps. I don't know who's going to train up and liberalize the militaries of Eastern Europe who've just joined NATO, nor do I know who's going to train with the West European allies so that interoperability will be as effective as it was in the first Gulf War. Europe may create its own military over time, but the European Union is nowhere near that goal today. NATO, therefore, remains critical for Europe's internal and external security. Its influence and policy capacity is directly proportional to the size of U.S. forces deployed in Europe. You'll hear people say, let's make NATO more political and less military. It is only political because it has been heavily military. It's simply uh, uh, a, a, a non sequitur to, to call for that change. Finally, 
The energy policy of no energy policy ensures more shocks ahead while funneling billions of dollars into the hands of those in the Middle East and Southwest Asia who may not wish us well. A serious energy policy would include putting several dollars of tax on every gallon of gasoline, a motor transport fuel. The resulting revenues would be put into a Manhattan-like crash project and to find other kinds of energy for motor transport. These are not ordinary times. Minor modification in national security strategy and our economic policies merely perpetuate the erosion of American hegemony. I, I try to alarm you today so that we can wake up in time to avoid calamity. I do not, however, believe I exaggerate the dangers. In our present predicament, we desperately need leadership that can fundamentally redirect U.S. foreign policy and strategy, not merely fine-tune it. Thank you for your attention and the special opportunity to come up here and speak at Middlebury. Now, I have agreed to take questions, and um, Ed Knox said that, that, that I would, uh, could referee taking the questions if I wanted to and take them to trouble. So, I'll, in the back row. Um, uh, two questions. I wonder what you think of uh, Biden's uh, Oh, could you tell us who you are? Okay. Uh, thank you. I should have said that in advance. Uh, to, the, to the first question on the Biden, uh, Peter Galbraith, another proposal, I guess Les Gell puts his name on it. Um, I don't, that may happen, the fragmentation. It'll be a bloody transition. I don't see why the United States should take credit for initiating it. Therefore, I find it a mindless policy. I, I just don't, don't see any reason for doing that. You would do stay in and, and preside over ethnic cleansing of these cities because you're going to have to separate large populations in, in Baghdad, Kirkuk, uh, other parts of the country. Uh, furthermore, populations don't tend to stay separated. Uh, it's just one more of these kinds of problems that I don't think... Uh, we can do anything about. It, it may be a noble aspiration on their part. Second, on nuclear terrorism, I think the prospects of terrorists being able to detonate a weapon and have an actual uh, nuclear explosion is trivial. Uh, they can ex explode dirty bombs that spread around a lot of radioactive material. The impact of that is largely psychological. If we were not hysterical about nuclear weapons, if we had a higher level of nuclear literacy, and universities, I might say, have contributed enormously to the level of nuclear illiteracy in the country, it makes us all knee-jerk about it. Uh, and you're going to have to come around on that because nuclear power is going to be the one of the ways out of the, out of the, the dependency on oil. Uh, so I think that the prospects of that are fairly low. If we really wanted to do something about it, we get serious about a settlement in Israel between the Palestinians. To sit around and wring your hands about that problem when you're not doing anything about the other strikes me as one example of the height of irresponsibility in leadership. Next question. Yes, sir.
Okay, fair enough. I'm, I, I won't, won't accuse you of that until you've proven it. <laughs> uh, you've asked me now to come up with what will be my nuclear policy since I've condemned our non-proliferation policy. Uh, the treaty may not be salvageable. We're going to have to get used to proliferation. I wouldn't denounce the treaty outright. Maybe something can be restored from it. We have to particularize the approach toward each case. And we've not done that. We've given primacy over political stability in Northeast Asia to nonproliferation in North Korea. I would ignore the North Korean weapon. We can't do anything about it. We give Kim Jong-il incredible incentives to proliferate because we're so knee-jerk about it. He's even said this publicly. I know what the West will do when I do this, you know, and he laughs. And we're doing exactly what he could have predicted. B.F. Skinner would have been, you know, very able to predict this kind of behavior quite, quite well. I think were the president to ignore North Korea's weapons, take them off the agenda, refuse to talk about them, privately tell the North Koreans, use them, and we will retaliate. Tell the South Koreans, look, if you want to live next to a North Korea with nuclear weapons and don't want to oppose it, that's your choice. Our arrangement with Korea used to be we keep the big powers of Japan, China, and Russia from dabbling in and trying to control affairs on the Korean Peninsula as they always have done and let the Koreans handle change on the peninsula the way they want to. And I would say to them, if you want to subsidize the northern regime and the oppression of North Koreans, that's your problem. That's, that's your choice. But I am going to ignore that. I think Kim Jong-il, he'd just be crestfallen. You know, what's he going to do? What are you going to do with these things other than start a war you can't win? They are the most overrated military weapon around. I, I didn't learn my anti-nuclear anti uh, feelings from uh, rallies of, of, of peace movements and things like that. I, I was trained as a nuclear targeting officer, tactical nukes in Europe. And if you actually try to plan a fire plan for a, uh, a brigade or division operation and use those things, they're messy. They just create all kinds of problems for you. And if you can find a way to develop your fire support plan without nuclear weapons, <laughs> professional soldiers will go that way. I'll even suggest that it might be instructive were a couple of countries in the world, new proliferation uh, countries, uh, to have a war with each other and to use their weapons and to create a lot of dust. Uh, they won't kill as many people as we think, but neither side will win, and they'll be back to fighting and slogging it out at the infantry level, uh, and they will not have gain the great victories they anticipate for having these nuclear weapons. I think that would greatly devalue the coin in the world. We have greatly valued the coin by threatening to invade. The axis of evil a slogan has done more to accelerate proliferation than almost anything I can do. The next worst thing is that we complained about India and Pakistan, and then we turn around and embrace them. So that's... Uh, that's where I think we're going to have to go. We're going to have to get used to this. We are, we are, we're caught in some paradoxes, uh, some contradictions that I don't see any logical way out of. We believe in sovereignty. The president invokes our sovereignty all the time. Now, what if somebody told us what we could do with technology in this country? If they told us we can't use our weapons to attack some other country, we accepted that when we signed the UN Charter. But would we sign a UN Charter or a treaty that said, we can't advance our technological know-how and our ability to do things with technology in particular areas. The Iranians and the North Koreans are very shrewd in having picked this out to push it against our liberal view, I mean, uh, our illiberal view of, uh, of, of sovereignty. Okay, next question. Yes, sir. And you're who? Uh, the, go ahead. Um, before we invaded Iraq, there were many intelligent, thoughtful people who predicted all the adverse outcomes. Historians, etc., many of them not to be true. But in retrospect, they turned out to have been correct. Do you have any suggestions for how we incorporate the tremendous knowledge base that we have to prevent these mistakes? We're talking about human behavior. 
Well, I suppose age has made me somewhat cynical. The spirit, but did everyone understand his question? Anybody want me to repeat it? I would, Ed Knox said sometimes you can't hear it. If you want it repeated, I'll do it. Well, uh, uh, the uh, rulers are going to make choices, and they make them for reasons that may not be in line with 18th century rationalism. See, this, the spirit which you've evoked with that statement comes right out of the 18th century. And if you look at the peace movement, when, you know when the U.S. peace movement was formed? And when the English peace movement? 1816. Uh, Cobden and Bright used to say, the peace movement and the free trade movement are one and the same for me. Countries trade, they won't fight. We should have a peace movement. We found again and again and again that history shows us this is not the case. But we keep on suggesting that's the case. Now, uh, that's, that's one answer. Let me give you another answer. How many professors of history and political science agree with each other? There are very distinguished professors like Fuad Ajami, who was all for this war. There is no unambiguous assessment of the facts in these cases. Now, I quite agree that in the case of Iraq, it seems to me the arguments were overwhelming against it. And my own discipline, I think, is very uh, remiss for not having been much louder about this. How many countries in the world have constitutional orders that are stable and have a sectarian division as, de as deep and as profound as the Shiites and the Sunnis? And how many have uh, ethnic uh, uh, divisions within their country? Canada, with two ethnic divisions, teeters on the brink of collapse now and then. Uh, <laughs> Britain, with four tribes, is in a state of devolution. So, uh, to me, this was not a, not a hard one to call. Furthermore, the Bush's father, H. Bush, made the arguments for not going there, and so did Dick Cheney on ABC Sunday morning once. He gave about a 30 or 40 second rundown of all of the disaster that would uh, occur were our troops to go all the way to Baghdad. So. Um, the world is not always ruled with wisdom. Another way to look at it is half the time, you know, wars are two-sided, half the time one side, uh, a side is making stupid decisions. We just joined the stupid side this time. <laughs> yes, sir. In many ways, they're very similar. I've written a short piece in which I t divide the Vietnam War into three phases and the Iraq War into three phases, and the analogies are staggering and striking, compelling. There was no strategic significance of, of Vietnam that compares to the strategic significance of sitting in, the, in, in this oil-rich part of the world with lots of countries ready to go to war and with huge amounts of petrodollars. That didn't exist in, in Vietnam. This, you, I, I'm very glad you brought this up because getting out of Vietnam was said at the time to be something that would affect our credibility. We couldn't afford to do it. I listened to those arguments. I was against the war in Vietnam for very much the reasons I am in this one. It was not in our interest. Containing China was the official reason for being there so-called prevent the dominoes. Well, North Korea was a great aid in, in containing China. The Soviet Union had a major foreign policy objective of containing China in the 1960s. Why we would fight, send a half a million troops in pursuit of Soviet and North Korean uh, uh, foreign policy objectives, I don't know, but we did. Interestingly, when we got out or were kicked out, our position in the world went up rapidly. I think it surprised everybody as to how fast it came back. <clears throat> I think it will come back 
less rapidly this time uh, for the following reasons. First, we don't have the Soviet threat, which we had at the time to revitalize NATO. The exacerbation of the Atlantic Alliance relationships is much deeper today than I recall it being during the Vietnam War. I finally make this judgment because I hope I'm wrong on that. I'd rather not be right. I'd like to draw another analogy right now with respect to the uh, uh, Atlantic Alliance. Some people refer to 9-11 as like Pearl Harbor, 7 uh, December 1941. Uh, historian Paul Schroeder said that's not the right analogy. It's June 28, 1914, when a terrorist, Gavrilo Princi, assassinated the Archduke. And when he was asked in prison during World War I why he assassinated the Archduke, he was a member, by the way, of a terrorist group, the Black Hand. And uh, you might recall that the British and the French joined the Black. They supported the terrorists against the Austrians. And, but he said he wanted a war, and other Serbian great nationalists didn't agree with him. They thought the Habsburg Empire would slowly fall apart without a war. He thought it would take a war, but he had no army. So he did this in hopes that he could provoke the Austrians in to give him a, him a war. Well, that's al-Qaeda. Have we given them one? Yes, in Afghanistan, which I think made sense. But the one we've given them in Iraq is very much like the ultimatum to, to uh, uh, Serbia, World War I. <clears throat> and the analogy to the Habsburg Empire is the Atlantic Alliance. Now, it probably can still be rescued because many of the institutions that I mentioned here are still important, and there are lots of people on both sides of the Atlantic, particularly in the business community, who understand that not only these business and economic relations are important, but also the strong military ties remain important. Uh, it may turn out that we could pull out and things would not be nearly as disastrous as we expect. I don't make that argument because people say, well, you're just a, you know, you're not being realistic. Well, I'll be realistic and say, even if I know they're going to be as bad as the, all the naysayers say they are, it still is in my interest to pull out. And if you turn out to be right with this analogy, I'll pocket that as a bonus. So that would be my answer to that one. Down here, yes, sir. Good, I'm glad to have a student. I was afraid we didn't have any. <laughs> then what? Well, in the first place, uh, I don't think there's going to be much growth of democracy in that part of the world. Uh, there's just no tradition for it. Uh, <clears throat> Samuel Huntington, a great student of, of, of comparative politics, uh, has pointed out many times that among the cultures resistant, this is by uh, long before his A Clash of Civilizations book, that certain religious cultures are more resistant to liberal developments than others. The most friendly to it has been Protestantism. The next has been probably Catholicism, but Catholicism has a very mixed record on it. Uh, Buddhism tends to be kind of neutral. Confucianism and Islam tend to be very hostile to it. So we're dealing with an old and very rooted set of values in the Middle East that are resistant to these things. And I'd even say that to the degree Israel becomes more and more uh, theocratic, you'll, it will become more and more resistant to that. So I don't think there's a future for, for what you, you're suggesting in the Middle East. So w democracy, yes, not liberalism. Iran has a democracy right now. Uh, Egypt votes, a lot of the other countries vote, so they're, they're illegal democracies. But I'm assuming you really meant constitutionalism, maybe not. Uh, I don't think Iran's going to use the nuclear weapon on anybody. 
I think Mahadini Jod is very clever, like Kim Jong-il. He really knows how to uh, cause us to jump and hop. If you watched his performance here in the U.S., he was absolutely cool. He knew every way to punch us and <laughs> smile. And we responded exactly as he went. We made a hero of him. Uh, the Iranians have a lot of, uh, objectively, they have a lot of interest to share with us. They don't like al-Qaeda, we don't like al-Qaeda. They don't like the Taliban, we don't like the Taliban. They want to sell oil, we, we've been reluctant to buy Iranian oil. Um, where we differ is over nuclear weapons right now and Hezbollah. We're going to increasingly differ over control in Iraq. We're going to leave Iran with a huge amount of influence. I don't think that they're going to own Iraq, as some people say, that the Shiites, are going to, the Shiites probably will end up with the government in the larger part of the country if it stays together. Uh, but I don't think, I don't, I, the Persians and Arabs don't like each other long before there was Islam. Uh, and the Persians look down on the Arabs, there's no sense they're uh, equals. So I think that will trump uh, religion at, at certain periods. So the Iraqis are going to keep their distance. But I think we have opened up the Shiite-Sunni split in the Arab world, which has been most prominent between the Persians and the Arabs, not within the Arab world, with the exception of Lebanon. Now it could go right down into Kuwait, northern Iraq, and so the Arab world may find itself in an intra-regional sectarian <coughs> struggle along those lines. So the, the complexities are great as to what would be open. Another thing you should remember about the Iranians, they don't call the Persian Gulf, the Persian Gulf, for nothing. They think they're entitled to the entire lib, uh, literal. They will be making claims on the sheikdoms. They will do everything they can to assert influence on the Saudis and others. Uh, they will, these will be very difficult times afterwards. Uh, but anybody that knew the region could well anticipate that these kinds of things are going to happen. That's going to happen with or without nuclear weapons. So, uh, again, on the nuclear weapon issue, if we were simply to ignore it or tell the Iranians, you live in a bad neighborhood, you need nukes, why don't we cooperate, we might find that they... Ex I don't think they'll do it uh, to the degree of normalization and accept an American embassy there, but I do think there's some prospect of working out under the table deals with the Iranians. We may have let them have so much of a grip on Iraq that that's less likely than if we hadn't invaded Iraq. Next question. Green shirt up there. Oh, I was pointing to behind you, but go ahead. You're, the fellow behind you is next. He's next. I didn't get the last. If the era... In case you didn't hear that, he said, uh, he said, I'm radically right or something like that. I mean, you know, I, these are very compelling arguments. What are the odds that Congress and the White House are going to follow any of this advice? And then uh, what, what, what prospects are there that Arab countries will help us out of this problem? Um, well, obviously, uh, what I say is easy to say, and, and it's not going to have any effect whatsoever. I suffer no illusions on that. I mean, having <clears throat> been in a White House for four years. <clears throat> I've listened to outside advice and ignored it with reckless abandon. And <laughs> so, you know, I'm just, what is the old, uh, I think it was, uh, LBJ said, uh, you're either inside the tent pissing, inside the tent pissing out or outside the tent pissing in, I guess. <laughs> you know, I just switched positions. <laughs> uh, I've actually said that I think we'll probably fly out of the green zone the way we did in, uh, and <clears throat> we flew out of the embassy in, in, Pox, in, uh, in Vietnam. I, in, and unfortunately, I think it may be more bloody. We could end up losing a lot of troops there. Uh, 
it's just increasingly will un- unravel on us. Uh, so uh, rather than taking my advice, I think that's more likely to happen. You do see a couple of signs lately that are worth watching. Um, Jim Baker, and uh, I guess he's working with uh, Lee Hamilton, has said lately, and I think it was reported in the New York Times, that uh, it's time to really think about changing course, and he's rejected the biden uh, uh, Galbraith division appeal. I think he's right on that. Uh, and I suspect that Bush's father has encouraged him to go up there, and I know, I, I, I've heard from pretty good uh, sources that the father is very disturbed about his son. He never supported this war. Uh, Barbara Bush is another matter. She's full swing behind it, and he doesn't raise it with her. The father doesn't raise it with his wife. <laughs> but I think he's sufficiently worried to try to get somebody to do that, and Jim Baker has a reputation of being really a first world-class fixer. So that he's beginning to make these noises, he's running a study, um, is a sign that somebody may decide we should change course. I was struck by Senator Warner uh, having returned from Iraq recently, saying that if our strategy isn't working in a month or two, we're going to have to change it. Now that's, for for a lot of members of the, of the Congress, that wouldn't be a very interesting statement. Warner is in a very strong position as chairman of the House of the Senate Armed Services Committee. He's an old Republican bull who's always been counted on to flack for the administration to defend absolutely ridiculous policies, and he can do it with great aplomb, <laughs> great dignity, but he's not stupid as those policies sound. He's a very clever politician and a very skilled, pol- skilled politician. If he decided to turn this around, we might see some things begin to change. Remember, who turned around Lyndon Johnson? A Democratic Senate. I don't think the Democrats either have the the stomach for it or the competence, certainly not the votes to turn this around. It will likely be turned around with Republicans. I know at least six House member Republicans who voted against the war who consider it a disaster know they're going to pay heavily for this. Uh, the leadership keeps them from having any debate. There was, you realize there wasn't one minute of debate before the House took its resolution on support of the war. Uh, uh, Congressman Walter Jones of North Carolina, who's infamous for having invented freedom fries to replace French fries, he's since now changed that. He's against the war, tried to enroll a resolution. They won't let him enroll his resolution to pull the troops out. So he's trying to enroll a resolution to have 17 hours of floor debate on it. The House, Republican House leadership will not do it. Uh, so, but these are signs that I'm watching, um, and it just seems to me that things are moving faster than, than the calculators in the Defense Department or the White House or some of the uh, cloakrooms in the Congress. Next question. Part, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, you, you're, you're, yeah, right. You're good. Okay. I don't believe in supporting all these organizations. I believe in supporting quite a few of them. <clears throat> uh, the tactics of the, of the Kyoto uh, Treaty uh, struck me as ill-advised in, the case, in Bush's case. <clears throat> the odds are, if you tried to implement the Kyoto Treaty, the Europeans are well shown it. So why should we take the blame for having broken it up? We should just sign it, go along, let the Europeans prove out to be the hypocrites they are. I mean, it's really dumb. I never understood why anybody would be against that. Um, On the uh, landmines, I have a completely different view on it. I think the landmine movement is one of the most ridiculous, hypocritical movements ever. What's the lady up here who won the Nobel Prize, Jody Williams? Well, I was asked to speak. No, you couldn't get any other generals to talk about her on CNN, so I talked about her when she won the prize. And I said, she's never removed a landmine. She just sits up here and uses her email. 
There's a French colonel who went down to Angola and began to organize villages and remove landmines. All that landmine moving has done nothing. They don't do anything to remove landmines. They have meetings, they live in great hotels, dinners, they get awards, and they feel good. But they don't keep kids from stumbling into mines in Cambodia, Afghanistan, and, and, and uh, uh, Angola. You're not going to prevent the use of landmines. Just the more you can prevent the use of nuclear weapons if somebody decides to use them, or rifles, or machetes. You know, machetes are pretty good uh, 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 genocide tools, as we've learned. So I, I find these it's sort of, I consider it sort of, you know, just high-flying anti-intellectualism. Another, yes, sir. On, on the, the we, right. I, you know, if you didn't hear it, what are the what is, what is he th what do I think the chances are we will bomb Iran? And I think what magazine had the picture on it? Time. Time. Uh, and about whether Israel would do it. You know, I don't have any better information on that than any of you do. All I can say is it makes no sense, and I don't see why anybody would do it. Uh, we may be stupid enough to do it. Uh, you can't eliminate the program by bombing. We know that. There's a very good piece out by an Air Force colonel who's quite a strategic bombing planner who's gone through all the things you can do, and you sort of think he's for bombing it until you get to the end, and he points out, this is not, you won't get there from here, the, that the Air Force has promised this kind of a capability, this kind of delivery, or this kind of result, again and again, and it's never succeeded. So it's a policy you know won't remove the weapons. You know it will make Iran an inveterate enemy for longer than now. You know it will uh, in increase the intensity of anti-Americanism in that region and perhaps elsewhere. So you'll get all the disadvantages and none of the advantages of that policy. We may do it. I don't think Israel has the our power to get over there to do it. I think what's what you're beginning to, what you saw in the case of Lebanon, that Israelis have an exaggerated notion of their military competence. And uh, it's best in that region, but they're not up against much in that region. The Iranians are not Arabs. Uh, and they're much more sophisticated. They're buying um, what we used to call in the intelligence unit SA-10 air defense systems, which uh, the Israelis won't fly through easily. We won't fly through them easily. Um, so I, I kind of doubt the Israelis will try to do that, particularly after, after Lebanon. We're going to have to end up living with an Iranian nuclear weapon if we don't find some other policy in the meanwhile which is more political and more threatening. Uh, the uh, Iranians are not close to having a nuclear weapon. They don't have the fissile material. And as far as I'm able to judge, they're not likely to have it in the next five, six, ten years. There may be someone here who's better informed on that than I am. <clears throat> so it's not nearly as urgent as the case of North Korea. Uh, it's another reason that I strongly encourage a policy of coming to terms with some sort of rapprochement under the table or otherwise with Iran. Uh, what, what the Israelis could do is put their own nuke on the table and say, look, Iran, if you'll give it up, let's make this a nuclear-free area. I mean, that might be, I think, a wise policy from there. Uh, I don't think there's much chance of that, certainly not with Likud in power. Uh, but um, that, that, that's about all I can say. I, I can only be highly speculative on this. and It's, it's not a good thought but, uh, that, that we would do that, but that's why I made this point earlier. What the, about nonproliferation? We've let this nonproliferation policy become the enemy of our own best interest. I think we probably could have designed political strategies for Iran that make this less likely. Let me add one last point about Iran. I played in a game that was organized under the policy plan, planning staff in the State Department about three years ago. Uh, where there were two teams 
trying to come up with policies that would prevent Iranians from having designing a nuclear weapon. Uh, how we should go about it? Well, I was the leader of one team, somebody else is the leader of the other, and uh, we weren't paying against each other, we were just having alternative or, you know, uh, comparative approaches. My team was f filled with professional counterproliferation people who were just uh, foaming at the mouth, you know, to use sticks to beat up on Iran. And I listened to this, and I started thinking out loud. I said, what is in our major interest in that region? Nonproliferation or stability? Would we, would we rather have people not wanting to fight each other, or would we rather have nonproliferation and people really wanting to fight each other a lot? And it occurred to me I'd rather have stability, because I know I'm not going to prevent proliferation over the longer period. Now, if we use all these sticks, we're going to fail, and we will have all the disadvantage of the sticks and none of the advantage of the carrots. So I refused to make the proposal for my side and said, look, why don't we go make the offer more or less like what you said here. There were two Iranians participating, one an American Iranian professor and another who had been in the Iranian government under the clerics and had left because he fell out of favor. And they argued, and I don't know whether, that this not only would work, but that the Iranians will go to the level that Pakistanis stayed for quite a while without exploding a weapon, keep it as a thing, something they can do in a short amount of time if they want to. Well, they might. That would be an interesting solution. But I, I think we should follow a policy like that, even if we know they're going to explode a nuke, because I don't see how we're going to prevent it. And if we follow the, the sticks policy, I've already enumerated all the untoward consequences uh, we're, we're going to have with them. Listen, I'm getting the signal. It's a lot. One, one more? Yes, sir. Well, let me tell you, there's a law called 18 U.S. Code 798 that says to talk about this, uh, about uh, doing SIGINT or, or what you get from SIGINT is a felony, so I don't want to violate that law. But I will say the following. Uh, I don't have any privileged information. I don't want it on that. In fact, I've not gone out to an old director's day, so I wouldn't become pregnant with information I didn't want to talk about. <coughs> I suspect that there's not much yield from what they're doing. Uh, and I think it was a program initiated in a certain amount of panic because they weren't doing all that well against the uh, uh, terrorists. Uh, but that's speculation. What's puzzling to me is that the director would do this without first going to the Congress. There was no better time for a director than after 9-11 to go down to the Congress and say, look, I need a revision in FISA to be able to do this legally. Why would he do that? Now, I've heard, well, the White House took the initiative. The people at the White House don't have a clue as to the complexity of taking SIGINT. Lots of people out there in NSA don't understand it. So this is a highly complex matter, so the initiative has got to come from NSA, at least the knowledge they could do it. So um, it's a strange thing. It's a really a strange thing. Uh, General Lou Allen, who was the director of NSA years ago, <clears throat> was told to do some things like this, use domestic, engage in some direct, domestic surveillance, and he just wrote in the White House a memorandum and said he wasn't going to do it. He didn't hear back. Uh, he told me that as advice before I went out there. Well, I got some advice from the White House that I won't get into that I kind of told him to buzz off on. Uh, I said, you know, I want an appointment with Ronald Reagan if you really mean you're going to do this. And uh, you know, I didn't hear any more. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know why Hayden didn't do that. Uh, so. I, I just just don't see any re I don't see any reason for any of these changing laws. I, I, I back to the, my earlier point, acts of parliament have closed some democracies. <clears throat> I'm not democratic, but I'm sure liberal. I believe in my rights. I want those above everything else. We have to vote, I'll put up with it. But, but, my, but, my, but my rights come a lot quicker than majorities. I'm terrified of majorities. <clears throat> and uh, so, that's, that's, that's how I feel on it, and um, 
I think it's just really become increasingly a big mess. I, I don't know what the truth is. If there is some magic way, I mean, th this is yielding some really important intelligence, it seems to me it ought to be a, easy to convince the Congress and others to revise the, revise the statute. So that would be my thoughts on that. Thank you very much. By the way. Thank you. Thank you for being the traditional, outstanding military audience. I always like the provocative questions up here. Every time I've been, I've been really, you're really a great group to talk to. All the best.